Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Oh, for some reason I've gone uh, down here small, but hello. <laughs> uh, today's topic is lowering costs through water and energy conservation for food and beverage manufacturers with Cara Conanac, Conanac from DMV GL Business Assurance. And uh, we've also got Natasha joining us from DMVGL later. Um, yeah, type in the sidebar. Uh, tell us where you're joining us from. And also, just for a bit of uh, interest, tell us what your job title is. Because, um, you know, it's a bit of a different subject to food safety. We're talking about sort of um, energy and water efficiency and saving costs. Uh, so, yeah, let us know your interest in the sidebar. Um it is being recorded today, as we do every week, so we will follow up afterwards with the slides, uh, certificate of attendance, which you'll get for this webinar, and also the webinar recording. So if you miss a bit, don't worry. Um, as we say every week, these webinars, Food Safety Fridays, are sponsored. Uh, our kind sponsors uh, help to bring these free of charge, bite-sized education every week. And... Uh, on that note, I'm going to play the video ads from the sponsors and I'll be back to introduce you to our guest speaker shortly. Okay, we're back. Uh, next to me, this is Cara Kokanak. Good, good morning, Cara. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm well. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. And where, where are you joining us from today, Cara? I'm in Arlington, Virginia, so our DC office. And it looks quite bright out the back window there. Can it's you see? bright and sunny, but it is cold. So cold. I'm all bundled up. Right. And then, uh, unfortunately, we've also got Natasha De Silva from DMVGL, but uh, no webcam. But can you say hello, Natasha? Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Natasha De Silva. Um, I'm based out of Oakland, California. So the sun has just started to rise over here. <laughs> Lovely. And it's absolutely pouring down with rain as usual here in Manchester in the UK. Um, can you see the sidebar, Cara, just before we start with the presentation? People have been typing in. Yes, I, uh, I can see it. So various um, different uh, occupations, but all very welcome anyway. Um, yeah. Right, I'll get the slides up. Um, I'll be joining in for some polls and then uh, Natasha will be joining in for the Q&A later. But for now... And you're over to Cara for the presentation. Great. Thank you and welcome. And I'll be turning my, my webcam off here while I run through the presentation. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm excited to talk to people um, from a, a different sector than I'm usually talking to. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, I actually grew up on the East Coast, and I saw on the sidebar there that we had someone from South Jersey, I think Kathy from South New Jersey, so shout out to Kathy. I grew up in Southern New Jersey, um, near Philadelphia, and uh, went to graduate school out in California where I got um, my experience in green building and sustainability. So I've been working for DNVGL for over 11 years. Um, and my experience um, speaks to what we're going to talk about today. My experience is really in the built environment. So whether that be a building, a community, or a city, my focus is really on the built environment, which I think is going to be a little bit different from what you're usually hearing on, on these webinars on Food Safety Fridays. I do, I must say too that um, I had never attended one of these talks before, so I'm not really sure about the range of experience that folks usually have. So I went in this um, really hoping that people on the call would learn a little bit about what I do, what DMVGL does, and learn from, from some case studies we have on unbuilt projects that have saved energy, water, and our and or lowered costs from energy and water conservation measures. So that's my hope for today. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them at the end, or I'll be taking a look at the sidebar as we go through. If there's any burning questions or you can't hear me, or because I am from New Jersey, I talk too fast, feel free to tell me to slow down. <laughs> so let's get started here. Um, today's talk, we're going to go through, as I mentioned, 
an introduction to DNVGL. I'll talk a little bit about energy and water view it, as an overview. Um, we'll have a poll there and talk about um, what the state of energy use and water use is in the US. My, my data here is gonna be US based. Um, and then we're gonna talk about energy and conserv energy conservation in food and beverage and go through some field work and case studies. And then at the end, hopefully if we have some time, I have some, some talking points about what some other folks in DNVGL are looking at in the future with, with food and beverage. Natasha is on the call. She can answer some questions about some of our case studies I'll go through early on um, and to answer your other questions about our business assurance team. So DNVGL um, was founded in 1864. It adopted its mission to safeguard life, property, and the environment. We offer risk-based environmental and safety services, including verification, validation and certification, and advisory services. Our offerings and sustainability provided trusted advice to businesses, cities, and communities in pursuit of trust with stakeholders. We have over 12,000 staff in 300 offices across 100 countries, and we are a premier provider of strategic and operational technical services. I wanna mention again that we, our focus here and our purpose is to safeguard life, property, and the environment, and I do think that fits really well with Food Safety Fridays, you know, obviously, Safety is one of our big priorities and um, food is a big part of that. What I wanna first start out with is talking about Energy Transition Outlook 2019. So this is something that is very recent that DNVGL has published. Um, DNVGL's Energy Transition Outlook provides an independent forecast of the energy future through 2050, looking at energy supply and demand globally and in 10 world regions. This is a prediction of what we see 2050 looking like. And I felt like this is a good start to our talk today about what the state of energy is in, in the US and the world right now and what we see, it's, what, how it's going to be progressing. So we predict a rapid decarbonization of the world's energy system with fossil and non-fossil sources split roughly equally in the century by mid-century, so 2050. This energy transition outlook is available for download and if this presentation is sent out to you at the end of the call, which I think it will be, you'll have a, a link provided. So just some, some points I pulled from the energy transition outlook. This is our energy transition outlook indicators in North America. This shows that the share of electricity will continue to increase about 21% uh, in 2017 and 44% in 2050. So we see electrification increasing. Then we see energy intensity more than having in 2050. And then that last set of bars is carbon intensity. So we see again, as I mentioned, decarbonization while it'll be a work in progress in 2050, it will be decreasing steadily. Now this is looking at our energy transition outlook, energy related emissions by sector. We've got transport in that gray bar. We've got buildings in the green bar and manufacturing in the dark bar. Those are our top three and we do see significant emission reductions in all three main, main sectors. Those reductions are due to a general overall decline in energy demand and increased efficiency. So this could be switching from oil to electricity and transport. Um, this could be switching from gold to gas and renewables to reduce the footprint in manufacturing. And for the building sector, switching from gas to electricity and switching from traditional electricity to renewables. So again, I, my focus is, is very much in that built environment. So a lot of what I talk today will be about the built environment, but certainly this gives a general outlook of what the energy status is now and what it will be in the future. A little bit more about what I do in DNVGL. As I mentioned before, I've been with the company for 11 years. I started out doing green building consulting and then have branched out and work with um, developers of communities, city planners, 
and um, corporations to provide uh, policy advisory and research and in energy efficiency programs, as well as program development and implementation. And then Natasha, as I mentioned, is on the line and she focuses a lot of her work on our, our business assurance team with industrial energy management. So our experience in food and beverage um, comes from a few different places. I'm gonna jump into some case studies later, but this is, the, these few slides are on what our business assurance team does in the lens of food. And um, Natasha can answer questions on these at the end, but we do have some experience in the food and beverage in terms of corporate sustainability programs. So this is a large spirits company, one of the largest in the world. And we initiated a strategic environmental review, including an assessment of the company's water footprint that covered its operations as well as the agriculture producers in its supply chain. And we also helped develop the company's approach to responsible sourcing. So this is including training for the company's staff and company's procurement managers um, and training them not only on the work we did, but also responsible sourcing principles and practices. Some more experience in our food and beverage industry. Um, this is another project that Natasha is familiar with. This is a tea company, and we provided a life cycle analysis to understand the resource and environmental impacts of producing um, the tea company's bottled teas. We did a deep dive into the transportation of ingredients, the, the on-site brewing and bottling, packaging, distribution, and retail refrigeration. We also measured environmental impacts, including climate impacts and emissions to air and water and resource intensity. But today we're gonna to talk about energy and water conservation um, in more of the built environment, as I mentioned before. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is do a quick poll and I think Simon's gonna help me with that. So I switched over to the slide for the poll and I wanna ask you all on the call what you think the top energy user is, and this is US data, um, is it commercial, industrial, residential transportation, and then what is the top water user in terms of sector? So I think you'll get a poll pop up. Mm -hmm. I've, um, I've set the first poll uh, question, what is the top energy user choices, commercial, industrial, residential, or transportation? Um, I don't know if you can see that in the sidebar, Kara, uh, can you, can you uh, see it? I don't if you click on the polls icon. So, uh, yes. in okay, great, great. Yeah. Yes, so we've got industrial about this saying seventy five percent are saying industrial about fifteen, transportation, residential seven and commercial two. So how how are they doing with that? <clears throat> well, I don't want to go to the next slide oh. yet because I don't want you guys to cheat and see what <laughs> the water okay. results are because I have the results on the same slide, but I'm writing these numbers down. Right. So I've got two sixty eight, nine and twenty one. Give or yeah. take, and then we can switch to the yeah. next so poll. So I'll end that poll, and then I'll start the other one. And that. now you should see that in the sidebar. Question, what is the top water user? And the possible choices are aquaculture, domestic, industrial, irrigation, livestock, mining, public supply, and thermoelectric. Um, and top choices are um, yeah, it looks <clears throat> like irrigation twenty seven and industrial twenty two twenty three. Yeah, let, I'm gonna write down the numbers that I see right now. <laughs> seven, so well, about. <laughs> yeah, we won't add it. We won't make sure it adds up to a hundred. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, all right, I've got it. We can right. close the poll and then I'll hop back in with the results. Okay. Great. Thank you all for participating. Um, you know, it, it's it's nice to have a little interaction in these webinars just to keep you guys uh, awake. And depending on the time of day, it is, you know, awake and caffeinated and involved. So here are the results. And this is the U.S. results. So let's see how it lines up. Pretty interestingly, industrial, you all had as the top energy user at 68%. So the, the actual top user of energy consumption in the U.S. is transportation at 37%. So it's pretty much split 
as a top users, tra transportation and industrial with commercial buildings and residential buildings, a much smaller trunk. So you all had industrial again at 68%, transportation at 21%. I always find this pretty shocking. I think um, we don't realize how much energy our transportation system uses. So that could be, you know, cars, planes, trains, shipping. So it's 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 a quite a large amount. And in the U.S., um, more than 101 quadrillion BTUs of energy are utilized per year. And this is per the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And these numbers are from 2018. Those are the, the most recent numbers. And then let's take a look at water. The top users for water, as you can see, are irrigation and thermoelectric. And let's see, the results had industrial and irrigation as the top users here with thermoelectric only had a 3% the last time I got it here was um, one of the smaller users. So that's a, that's a shocker too. So thermoelectric is a big user of water. Um, and that one that is obviously a little bit of a hidden user that we don't realize. So in terms of water, um, this, this information is from 2015. That's the most recent information on U.S. water per the U.S. Geological Society. And that is, um, they do that survey every that in 2020, but 2015 is the most recent information I had. So thank you for doing that. That's, that's enlightening for me to see what, what you all, um, had ideas for and, and what the actual numbers are. So looking a little bit more at that U.S. energy consumption, this is, again, information for the from the Energy Information Administration. And this shows those four sectors broken down into um, not only end use, but where the energy is coming from. So if we look at transportation, obviously, petroleum is is one of the big providers. And then when we look at industrial and commercial, which are the two sectors we're going to be talking about today. You do have some petroleum, but there's quite a bit of natural gas, um, electricity, and then there's some re renewables that you see popping up in the green bars, at least in, a, in industrial. And in commercial, it's teeny, teeny, tiny. I don't know if you can see it on your, your webcams at home, but it is in there. So let's take a look um, a little bit diving deeper into energy use in food production. So energy use in food project production has a whole set of, of different uses. So I didn't do a poll here, but this is the US food system um, information on energy use. So the US food system consumes 10.11 quadrillion BTUs of energy each year. So that's about 10% of the total energy use and a whopping 49% of that energy goes into handling, so that includes packing, refrigeration, restaurants, and food retail, followed by agriculture, which honestly I thought was gonna be the big number one user. So agriculture obviously includes the animals, um, animal husbandry, and the water and food that they consume, and also the crops that need water and fertilizer. Third is food processing when this is not necessarily on site, this is when food is transported to another spot and then processed there and then sent for handling. And then the lowest user is transportation, which is, is sort of interesting considering transportation is such a high user in the total US. Um, but this is just transporting food and that's at 14%. So looking at these four users, we're really gonna focus today as as I talk about the built environment on processing and handling. So the work that I do at DNBGL is really in, in that building scape. So whereas there are a lot of places to save energy and water in agriculture and transportation, um, my expertise and focus will not be on those two topics today. We're gonna be talking about the built environment and our case studies are gonna focus on two, um, two manufacturing, facilities and or retail facilities that um, process and handle food and beverage. And talking about buildings, I wanted to take a, lo a look at um, energy use 
in food service buildings. So this, this chart on the right here is commercial building energy consumption survey data. And this is all commercial um, buildings in the US. And you can see all the way on the top there, food service is the number one user of energy of all commercial buildings in the US. So that's a big chunk of energy. Food service buildings are very energy intensive. They use about five to seven times more energy per square foot than conventional commercial buildings. So this is due to intensive commercial kitchen appliances, um, exhaust systems, and uh, other high users in the, in the kitchen environment. So how do we implement conservation measures in the built environment? And I had an animation here. I guess you guys aren't seeing it, but that's okay. Um, so what? this is more of what I do in my day-to-day -day work. So this slide shows the process of incorporating conservation measures into the built environment. So number one, when you are building or, I, and I'm getting some notes that um, you guys cannot see the full slide, is that right? No, I, I think um, it's not everybody. Okay, um, okay, uh, just wanted to check because I know that. Um, I wanna make sure you guys can see what I'm talking about. So the process of incorporating conservation measures into the built environment starts out with your building site. So orientation and shading. So you include daylighting and natural ventilation, whether it's a new build or renovation. Next, you look at the building envelope, insulation, what materials are in your building, window properties. And then we usually look at lighting. This is, is the building daylit? Do we have occupancy sensors? Can we reduce wattage anywhere? Can we reduce lighting? Then we look at plug load. So this is Energy Star equipment. This is a this is a special one for for food and food and beverage industry because there are so many different types of equipment that are different than a regular commercial building. So this is looking at getting the most efficient um, equipment in a in a commercial kitchen or in a processing plant and making sure that if there is an Energy Star certification, you get that, or you're looking at the energy use of the equipment and getting the most efficient version. And then looking at mechanical equipment. And this is pretty standard for any building. There's gonna be some higher exhaust requirements for kitchen and manufacturing capabilities. But again, looking at size, the energy source, the efficiency, making sure that all of the demand on energy is as conservative as possible. So all five of those items I just mentioned are making sure that the building's demand on energy is as low as possible. And then we start looking at, lastly, renewable energy. So is there an opportunity for renewable energy on site? Can we add PV panels on the roof? Is there a PV panel farm nearby we can plug into? Can we utilize solar hot water heaters? Can we utilize wind energy? And then we put that all together. We usually have we have some great modeling systems and our ideal goal is for a zero net energy building. And if you all are not familiar with zero net energy building means, it really means that the building is producing enough energy through renewable sources to meet the energy demand. So it zeroes out. So how do we do this? What, what types of tools do we utilize to uh, make this all work. As I mentioned a little bit before, with daylighting, we have sim daylighting simulation tools and analytic tools that focus on making sure our building can be as daylight as possible if we have windows um, in office areas and manufacturing plants or commercial kitchens. I know that daylighting is not always possible in the manufacturing world or in the commercial kitchen world, but we want to make sure if there are daylighting opportunities, we take advantage of them. Computational fluid dynamics. So this is uh, running wind analyses and focused on natural ventilation. And if that's a possibility for any parts of maybe a warehouse or a manufacturing facility, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the barriers to natural ventilation in the food and beverage world in, a, in one of our case studies that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, we use modeling tools that focus on visual comfort, in, in this case, glare impact. That's more for an office environment. Uh, all three of those items 
fold into general energy modeling, where we look at all the systems of a building to make sure that they are all functioning efficiently, and giving us um, the most conservative energy and water numbers. We also, again, look at renewable energy calculations to make sure that if you're using um, PV power or photovoltaic panels, that they're positioned correctly, that they're on the right type of building, that they're at the right angle, and we're getting the maximum amount of power possible. And then lastly here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about water use analysis. This The presentation is a little bit more energy focused as um, DNVGL is, a, is an energy company, but we have incorporated uh, water calculator tools and water use analytic tools into our overall energy modeling scheme. So um, I did include a quick snapshot of one of our, our water calculators that we, we typically use for commercial buildings. And I, I know that it's probably pretty small here, but this is a snapshot of our, our Excel and web tool. And this is <clears throat> because looking at water consumption um, at any level requires looking at the, the water footprint, so the baseline water use. So whether that's a commercial building or that's a manufacturing plant, or even if that's agriculture and, and, and irrigation, you need to first look at what you're currently utilizing or what your standard would utilize in terms of water. So this water analytic tool is built for commercial buildings, but could also be easily applicable to food service with some minor alterations um, with the inputs or the type of, of equipment that is utilizing water. So water usage for food and likely gonna be clean in place items and heat exchanges, and then any type of manual cleaning, sanitation, and miscellaneous utility uses so you always want to look at what those big users are and how to um, conserve usage in those realms. And then and then that will trickle down. OK, so that's our, our background on, on what I do in my day to day and how we work with different projects on conserving energy and water. And I wanted to jump into a couple case studies on what we've done in the past what our successes have been there, and what some of the barriers have been, um, not always barriers, but maybe missed opportunities. And I'll give some reasons for, for why those can be barriers or missed opportunities as well. So the first case study is actually one of the first projects I worked on at DMVGL <clears throat> many years ago when I was in our Southern California office. This was located in Carpinteria, California. If any of you are familiar, Carpinteria is near Santa Barbara, California. It's a beautiful location, perfect temperature almost year round. And we were brought on about mid design phase for a major supermarket brand that was building, they were renovating a supermarket space on top of a hill overlooking the ocean, beautiful space. And they had some, some pretty large sustainability goals. They want it to go zero net energy. They want it to go zero waste. They want it to really hit their lighting efficiency. Uh, we mentioned natural ventilation and natural ref refrigeration as an opportunity. And they also wanted to pull in some community ed education. So because we were pulled into the project about mid-design phase, some of those lofty sustainability goals were just not attainable based on how far they had already gone in the design process. So we did um, run a few energy models and help them get to 50% energy use reduction. We didn't quite hit zero net energy. We got them to use 100% LED lighting design. And we also incorporated quite a bit of solar tube fixtures, which are... Um, a, a fixture that usually utilizes sunlight. Um, and if you guys are not familiar with that, I should have put a picture up here. It, it utilizes sunlight, um, but looks like a lady fixture inside the building. So um, we included quite a few solar tube fixtures in the, the supermarket design um, and reduced their energy by quite a bit. So the, the barrier implementation here, uh, the reason why we couldn't get to zero net energy were site constraints. Uh, there was not enough roof space for enough PV panels, and they did not have enough area that they owned to put up any PV panels in the associated parking lot 
or area. So we just couldn't get enough renewable energy on site to hit zero net energy. There were some budget constraints uh, at, at this point in design. Um, if we had been involved maybe early on design or when we, everyone was first at the table talking, we probably could have gotten some more of these sustainability measures pulled in. But at this point, um, it was it wasn't possible. And then corporate pro protocol. So um, this was a big one and very interesting. So we had um, we presented the opportunity for the site and the building to utilize natural ventilation uh, because it was located in a temperate zone and the design of the building could achieve very good thermal comfort levels for everyone in the building. Our analysis showed that for 85% of the summer period, occupants were experiencing great levels of thermal comfort in the space. It doesn't mean it would only utilize natural ventilation. There still is a backup system for the HVAC, but we really wanted to push that this building on this site could utilize <clears throat> thermal comfort and natural ve ventilation for most of the year. So you can install ceiling fans uh, in conjunction with the, the northern openings to ensure continuous air movement. And it was very exciting to see this. This could be a viable option for a supermarket. And, and the corporate um, protocol just was not comfortable with it. They said, you know, natural ventilation for a supermarket doesn't work. We can't do that. There's no way we can do that. Thanks for the information we'll do something else. So it, it, it's good and our intention was to educate the team about different natural ventilation options and maybe next time they have a building site that maybe is just an office and not a supermarket, we'll look at natural ventilation as an option which could greatly reduce obviously energy use. Um, but that's just something that we felt as a learning experience that you can present a really great opportunity but if corporate is not interested then it's a no-go. And then zero waste was an additional opportunity that we didn't take advantage of. And that was, again, um, for budget constraints at the time, zero waste was something that they were going to um, look at and add to their corporate protocol later on. But at that point, we were pulled out of the project. So I, I'm not aware if they ever hit that target. Um, but this, you know, talking about it today certainly reminds me to check in with, with the folks there and, and see how they're doing and see if they ever hit their zero waste target. Okay, so our my next case study is <clears throat> another built environment, but a different type of building. So not a supermarket. This is a food processing and educational center. This is a um, it's in Traverse City, Michigan, which I have never been to. But um, the this was a eventually will be a forty two thousand square foot mixed use, mixed use building, but was initially a elementary school that closed in 20, 2007. So this was initially a public elementary school that was constructed in 1958. It was a masonry building that was solidly constructed. It was a, a good building, but had limited insulation or no insulation throughout the building, which is surprising, obviously, because Michigan is a rather cold area. Those not familiar with US geography, it it's up by Detroit and has some pretty cold winters. So it is surprising that there was little to no insulation in the building and that it was a functioning school to 20 to 2007. <clears throat> but back in 1958, it was built without really much thought to energy conservation or technology upgrades. So this organic specialty food manufacturer manufacturer built that bought this building and wants to renovate it into a large food processing and educational center. And they want to do this with as energy efficiency, as energy efficient as possible. And they also want to lease space for other agricultural food companies and also include an educational center and classrooms and daycare. So there's pretty lofty goals for this center. But so again, um, I got a little backtrack there, but I want to just make sure that you guys understand that this this center includes a food processing facility. It includes space for other food processing and manufacturing. So not just the, the organic specialty food company that owns the building. It also is including classroom spaces for the community and also includes 
a daycare for employees. The owner will occupy, occupy about 42% of this space and then uh, community classrooms, daycare, um, and lease space for other agricultural companies will lease the other uh, 48%. There's also a retail store that's planned on site for not only the, the specialty food company that owns the building, but also the other folks that are leasing space to sell their goods on site as well. So a little bit about their energy and, and water stats. Their baseline energy use intensity of the school as built and renovated would be 72. So EUI, which is energy use intensity, is a, a term we use a lot in the built environment. And it means, if you all are not familiar, energy per square foot per year. So the baseline energy use intensity is 72. Their goal for energy use intensity was 40. So that's what we were trying to help them get to. We wanted their, their EUI to be 40. So how do we do that? We had a few energy conservation measures that we wanted to implement, and we ran through an energy model to see um, what the results would be. On the next page, I'll explain a little bit more about what these terms mean. So the energy conservation measures that we wanted to model were um, A, wall insulation. Obviously, you mentioned before that there was no insulation in the building or very little. So we wanted to add wall insulation and increase the inf efficiency of that wall insulation. So R38 is just a number um, that basically means it's a thicker insulation, so it's more effective. Roof inf number or letter B, roof insulation. We wanted to add roof insulation again to a higher efficiency, R36. to replace <clears throat> all the windows in the building to double paned windows, and then an add-on, letter D, Windows Plus. This is high performance glazing. So this is making sure that not only are the windows um, double panes, but they also um, are reflecting sunlight, reflecting heat to the most, uh, to the most efficient manner. Letter D is doors. We want it to replace all the doors with high performance doors and insulated garage doors. So the original plans um, showed for non-glass paned doors and this model shows high efficiency paned doors, uh, glass paned doors. <clears throat> and you'll see the results in a few minutes here, which, which changed greatly. Letter F is the lighting plans. This is including energy efficient lighting throughout the entire building. Letter G, occupancy sensors. This is also for lighting, but this includes occupancy sensors for all areas of the, in the building, including the warehouse and production facilities. So occupancy sensors obviously turn off and on the lights depending on who is in there or who's utilizing the space. Letter H, ventilation. So this is including ventilation systems that are zoned specifically for their use. So the original ventilation system in the building um, had the same ventilation requirements for the entire space, but there are different ventilation needs for warehouse versus production for obviously the daycare and classrooms and the public areas. Letter I uh, with a new HVAC system, so new rooftop units that were highly efficient and increased the heating and cooling efficiency of all the spaces. And then letter J is a 12% economizer. So this is... Um, increasing the, the boiler efficiency, basically. So putting in a more efficient boiler. And the next page shows the results of our energy model and our <clears throat> energy conservation measures. So if you can see on the left side, we have our, our baseline and then our baseline plus all the add-ons I just went through. If you look at the top line, baseline shows our, our total Energy demand um, is 21,371 total therms and uh, 265,375 kWh with a total EUI, as I mentioned before, of 72.4. And if you add all those energy conservation measures <clears throat> on the bottom line, circled in red, 
you see our resulting EUI, which is 43.69, which is pretty darn close to 40. So we hit that pretty close to 40, 40 EUI goal, and that is a 39.6% reduction based on those dozen conservation measures. And of course, um, something we haven't mentioned yet, but I wanted to make sure we talk about is what's the associated cost with this too? And what's the associated cost savings? So these again are the energy conservation measures on the left with windows just being combined with the capital and incremental cost of including these additional energy efficient measures um, listed in that one column that total about a little over 100,000 and then associated utility savings, whether that be through rebates and incentives, totaling 13,000, with a payback period all the way in the last column. So with the additional cost of a little over $100,000, uh, the payback period is about eight years. Uh, okay, so there were a couple, and I want to talk about this briefly. I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end here. But there were a few additional opportunities that we didn't take advantage of, or the project didn't take advantage of at this time. And those are, are pretty big ones. So number one is heat recovery. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, number two is daylighting. It was just not something that they, they were talking about. Um, that they had time to incorporate into the building. And then gamification, which is really um, programming and measurement and, ver measurement and verification of the building systems and incorporating consumer behavior into um, the, the building's mechanics. So heat recovery is big in food production. So much of the energy consumed in commercial kitchens is wasted through expelled air and water. And there's a lot of opportunities to capture waste heat. So the image on the right just shows different ways to capture <clears throat> waste heat. If you close an energy waste loop from appliances like dishwashers, freezers, exhaust hoods, and the like, you can result in significant energy savings and increased building performance. Common kitchen waste heat recovery systems include a kitchen and dishwasher hood. <coughs> so these waste recovery systems preheat makeup air that go back into um, the general system. For kitchen hood, kitchen hood heat recovery, there can be potential problems with grease buildup on filters and heat exchanger services. We look at dishwashers and sinks. The waste heat can be recaptured and pipes back to heat hot water. And then in refrigeration and HVAC units, waste heat can be captured and used to preheat makeup air or hot water. So there are a lot of opportunities for heat recovery and food production. I didn't have any examples of work I have done um, or any of my close colleagues had done at DMVGL, but I did wanna present um, a couple case studies that I found that, um, that show what heat recovery how heat recovery has used in other food production facilities. So for example, Cambridge Mill restaurants in Canada installed energy recovery ventilation systems, which captured 85% heat loss from the exhaust system. <clears throat> and the heat was used to preheat the building, make a bear and domestic hot water. A Burger King in Germany uses heat recovery ventilation system that cools and heats the restaurant and saves up to 73% of their yearly energy consumption. Then there's a Tim Hortons in Ontario that utilizes a waste heat recovery system and that generates an estimated savings of 34,000 kWh per year and water savings of um, 540,000 liters per year. And I am seeing a few questions come through. Um, asking about some terminology I'm using. Oh, and Natasha, thank you for answering that. I was worried I was gonna spit out a few um, acronyms that folks weren't, weren't gonna be familiar with, like HVAC, so I appreciate Natasha you being on, on board there. Um, 
And as I as I bring this to an end, I wanted to talk very briefly about looking ahead. Um, I, as I mentioned before, we had our DNVGL Energy Outlook, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what some folks at DNVGL are doing in terms of transforming technologies in the food and beverage industry. So a few, a few things to keep your eye on or keep our eye on um, are are tagging food and following it over the supply chain and creating transparency for the consumer, precision, precision production, like precision, precision agriculture and aquaculture, vertical farming, bringing food production into cities and into the built environment and into, um, and into buildings that are, are already producing other goods, nutrigenics, which is a personalization of nutritional value based on individual's genetic makeup, and alternative protein sources, including cell cultures, plants, aquaculture, and insects. So again, this is just something that DNVGL is keeping an eye on as we move into the future and move into a more energy efficient and water conservative future with our, our built environment and um, food and beverage. So that's all I have. Um, and I think we will move over into questions and Natasha will join me. And it's just about 10 minutes to the hour. And Simon, I can't hear you right now, so I might. Sorry, I forgot ah, again. There we go. Um, yeah, it's good to switch your microphone on. Um, I'm trying to conserve energy. Um, no, um, Thanks very much for that, Cara. It was a very good overview, and it was good to have uh, Natasha in the sidebar. She did um, all the way through there. She was answering little bits of questions, you know, with acronyms and things like yes, that. Thanks. Um, but, yes, there is, uh, let's see, a question from Hamid. Uh, all this definitely reduces the value of the product's environmental footprint, but what is the simple way to estimate the product's environmental footprint? So I, I think this question is asking how to calculate the, the baseline environmental footprint. So it really depends on what the product is and what part of um, the life cycle we're looking at. So if we're looking at the built environment, we go through the, the mechanics that I mentioned in the talk. I think probably Natasha can speak a little bit better to finding the environmental footprint of a particular product. Um, like, I, I'm not sure if the product we're talking about is a, is a hamburger or if it's a can of tuna. But um, Natasha, do you have a better response for a simple way? I think maybe the answer is there is no simple way, that it's all pretty complicated, but maybe Natasha has a, a better response to that. <laughs> do, do you, Natasha? Do you... <laughs> Is your hello, hello. Yes, my microphone was on <laughs> mute. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes. So one, one, as Kara alluded to, the there may not be a simple answer. Uh, but one way certainly is to conduct a life cycle analysis, and perhaps instead of um, doing a, a full scale analysis, really focusing on a particular scope. So instead of doing um, energy and water and waste, maybe focus on one that is. Uh, more achievable. Um, something like energy has uh, has really clear um, sources uh, if you're looking directly at your operations. And then if you are scaling up through your supply chain or your value chain, as you will, up or, up or downstream, depending on the full scale, you, you can get a sense based on assumptions and modeling from um, from uh, research that is out there. But Kara is correct that there is probably not a, not a simple answer depending on, on, on what product you're talking about. Okay. Um, there's a question there, but I'm not sure. Well, I can't understand. Maybe you can. Uh, from Ishaka, we produce the energy for our factory. This way, is it economic for us? The question mark. Um. So we produce the energy for our factory. Is this is I, if the question is asking, is this a good way to find out if um, is is doing an energy model a good way to find out if the factory is. Oh, OK, sorry. 
If you produce energy for our factory, yes, that is great. So if you are producing the energy for your factory via PV panels or wind or another renewable, that is very economic. If you're producing on-site energy is what I think the question is asking. Um, but a way to find out if your, your factory or your manufacturing plant is um, working efficiently, certainly an energy model or a baseline assessment would be a great way to figure that out. I hope that answered your question. Okay, thanks. Um, Prosper is asking, can we have a special presentation for tea growers and processors? It's a bit um, niche that um, Prosper, I don't know. Uh, we'll have to think about it. Probably not, I would say. Um, <laughs> Um, well, cer certainly we had that example about um, tea in, in the presentation. I know that's some, a project that Natasha worked on. So certainly I think if you have any questions, you can probably reach out to us directly and hopefully we can answer right. your questions. Okay. All right then. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right then, Prosper. What we'll do is obviously in the follow-up email, we'll put yeah. contact details. And if you do have further questions specifically about tea, um, yeah, perhaps Natasha will answer. Um, Prasanna is asking, could you please um, uh, please provide a few more details about solar tube fixtures? Sure, a solar tube fixture, and I wonder if I can. Well, I don't know if I could easily share my screen, but a solar tube fixture um, is basically a long tube that connects from the roof of the building and funnels down through and the end cap, it looks like a normal light fixture. So it, it funnels the light from the roof down through the, the roof fixture and into a ceiling fixture that looks like a regular light. So you can Google solar tube, but it's, it's a technology that's been around for quite a bit and it utilizes zero energy. So it is literally like a, um, uh, a window in the ceiling that funnels light into a fixture that looks like a light fixture. That's a good idea. Get some natural light in yes. the building for free. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Joy is asking, can we have a presentation specifically on water conservation in a food manufacturing environment? <laughs> yeah, and I know my, my presentation didn't focus on water, and I did forget to mention the reason that water was not part of the analysis for the Michigan processing plant is they utilized well water, so they didn't um, utilize public water. So it, the presentation was admittedly a little light on water, uh, but it's certainly something that I, I think would be useful for, for you all. And if I had a colleague that could jump in as a special guest, I, I would have done that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Iman is just saying thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, Maria, great session. Any further questions while we have uh, Cara and uh, Natasha here? Got a few more minutes. Um, uh, okay. Atelka, uh, can you provide some zero waste measures? So zero waste measures on how to include, um, let me think on that. So that's something I could certainly, if you want to, you know, email me, I could send you a list of our, our measures to incorporate a zero waste management plan. Um, off the top of my head, it certainly be would, would be streamlining the, the waste stream. Um, obviously, having your recycling capabilities up to par and having a composting stream as well is a big one. I know that a lot of food goes into the waste stream that could be composted. So having a composting program on site or coordinating with the city is always a good option. Um, and, and one way that we know that some folks in the industry are, are tackling it is also by uh, thinking about packaging and packaging redesign. Uh, and, and that that has been sort of a growing trend. And I think um, I can't recall which supermarkets, but some in the UK initiated um, a zero waste uh, concept, basically, which has um, then kind of spread throughout throughout um, global supermarkets. Yeah, there's a big drive in the UK, plastics uh, reduction, as, as there is everywhere, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unnecessary uh, packaging and things like that. Um, Prosper has just mentioned, I have uh, occup 
occupancy sensors uh, to be introduced at my workplace. Uh, that must be for lighting, is it? Um, how to recycle wastewater? That's from Rajiv. Any comments on that? Sure. Um, recycling wastewater, it can. Wastewater can be utilized in a couple forms. Gray water for irrigation. So um, utilizing wastewater to irrigate your landscape on a commercial building or um, irrigating. I'm not sure how it works in agricultural aspects. I do know it can be utilized in irrigation that um, is not meant for consumption. And then there are systems that recycle gray water into plumbing. So um, this would be through the, the toilet system, um, obviously not the drinking water, but any non-potable sources. So that um, depends on code for your city or your um, your region. Sometimes there's certain codes that allow that or don't allow that, but I have been in many buildings that recycle wastewater in the, the plumbing facilities. I think a, a good idea is that there's that many things out there is to talk to professionals because <laughs> uh, there's so many opportunities, I imagine, yeah. um, with tools, techniques and things you can buy and changes to the way you run your business to become more energy efficient, save money, etc. Yeah. Um, okay, Prasanna, can you provide us a presentation in plastic reduction in food packaging, especially dairy packages where it requires moisture absorption? Um, yeah, very specific. What we'll do is, uh, like I say, we'll put the contact details for mm -hmm. uh, DMVGL in the follow-up and you know, if you have questions, you can uh, contact directly. Um, anything else, generally? Well, pretty much uh, we've done it the hour. Um, yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for everyone's time. Thank you for inviting me today, and Natasha. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cara. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Natasha. I've enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you.